gentlemen. Welcome to Sankalp 2020. Welcome to a week of inspiration. My name is Amit Bhatia and I'm the founder and CEO of Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, twin initiatives in India for impact leadership and ecosystem development. I'm also an advisor to the Avishkar Group, India's number one impact investment platform. Our theme this year is an entrepreneurial renaissance, designing an impact economy. I'm delighted to kick off this impact renaissance week and will share a quick two minute story with you every day. In a cold January of 1417, a young Italian scholar, Poggio Braccelloni, made a fascinating discovery in a German monastery, which would warm the hearts of an entire continent. This young scholar who worked for seven different popes was fond of manuscript hunting, and he stumbled upon the last surviving work of the Roman philosopher Lucretius. This manuscript of a Latin poem of 7,400 lines, De Rurum Natura, or On the Nature of Things, contained progressive thoughts on the very nature of human beings, on the soul and body, on microscopic particles, atoms, in ceaseless motion, and it depicted a world free from religious fear and superstition. It sparked great interest and thought, and several scho scholars contend that this single act may have been the birth of the Renaissance. The poem's influence on Western thought is unquestionable. The Pulitzer Prize-winning 2011 book, The Swerve, How the World Became Modern by Stephen Gra Greenblatt, is a narrative of this very discovery. When in 1450, Johannes Gutenberg finally managed a breakthrough invention, when he revolutionized printing with the world's first printing press, the poem was soon printed and widely circulated. The 15th century saw many such inventions and came to be known as a period of rebirth and rediscovery of art and science as the Renaissance. Last year, the world celebrated 500 years of Leonardo da Vinci, the inimitable polymath of the Renaissance. The Renaissance reinforced that human beings are the ultimate source of value creation, or as the Greek philosopher Protagoras would put it, man is a measure of all things. History in future will see this current period, our lives, as center of another renaissance, the impact renaissance, where mankind is rising to reset capitalism, reinvent the purpose of capital and redirect the course of climate and social injustices. With this in mind, we at Aspire Impact have created the Impact Future Project, a thought leadership platform designed to enable and inform this critical period of reckoning. We are bringing together 300 leaders in 10 impact communities to rethink how corporations can catalyze the impact movement in India, preparing for an era of impact accounting and to compete in the global impact economy. The coming decade is the decade of action and we are all impact actors. Let's listen to 25 great actors of this impact renaissance. Today, as we kick off, we will first invite an impact actor, a true Renaissance man, a tireless campaigner of the impact movement, a thinker and innovator and impact investor and a serial impact entrepreneur. He's the founder of GSG, of social finance, of big society capital, of bridges fund management. He is Sir Ronald Cohen. I had the good fortune of working with Ronnie for three years at GSG and know firsthand that his stellar contributions and ideas like using unclaimed and dormant accounts to power impact wholesalers, impact bonds, outcome funds, impact weighted financial accounts will all go down in history as innovations of the impact renaissance. I'm delighted that we have him here both to launch the Impact Future Project and Sankalp 2020. Please welcome Sir Ronald Cohen. The 
It's a great pleasure for me to join you at this uh, Sandkalp uh, Forum. Uh, last time I, I spoke here is about five years ago, and a huge amount has happened in the impact uh, space. And this is a great opportunity for us to catch up about it. But before I start, I want to recognize Vinny Tri and Avishkar, who initiated this forum and continue to host it. And also my colleague at uh, the GSG, Amit Bhatia, who was our first uh, CEO, whose uh, Impact Future project in India is now contributing so much to advancing impact. The world is changing. We can see that change in the consumption uh, that uh, young people uh, are, are making, uh, purchasing only the products of companies whose values they share by their employment decisions, uh, refusing to work for companies that are polluting or uh, creating uh, social uh, issues and we also see it in the behavior of entrepreneurs who like many of you are thinking now in terms of ventures that uh, are able both to do good and to do well and the more positive impact they deliver uh, the more profit uh, they make and these changes have not been lost on investors uh, and so it is that uh, we see now $30 trillion or more of ESG investing, environmental, social and governance investing, where there is an intention to deliver both impact and profit through investment in, in companies. Now, $30 trillion is not a trivial sum. Uh, it is equivalent to a third of all professionally managed money in the world. So this is way beyond a, a tipping point uh, now. And if we look at uh, impact investment proper, where you not only have the intention to create the impact, but uh, you also measure the impact creating, we will hit a trillion dollars this year. Uh, that is equivalent to the whole of uh, the world's venture capital uh, pool. Uh, so it's clear that investors now want impact and the pressure for them to have uh, the impact uh, measurement uh, which uh, they require uh, is increasing all the time uh, on regulators and on governments. Uh, an initiative that I'm involved with at uh, Harvard Business School, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, has published the accounts of 1,800 companies measuring their environmental impact. And when you look at uh, the environmental damage that these 1,800 companies um, cause, uh, your mind boggles. Uh, 250 of them create more environmental damage a year than they create in profit. A third create environmental damage equivalent to 25% or more of their profit. And when this uh, transparency uh, begins to spread, and when it's accompanied by transparency on the employment impact of companies, measuring the cost of uh, lacking diversity, where you measure the number of people from minority groups that uh, are employed by a company and you compare uh, that number to the demographics around the facilities of that company and you ascribe once again the salary levels um, to those missing uh, people, uh, then you begin to get a significant monetary value of the uh, cost of lack of diversity uh, and, and similarly product impact. Um, we are able today because of technology and big data uh, to put real numbers down uh, for the impact of a, of a nutritional uh, product or a car or whatever else uh, uh, you want to analyze. And when this impact transparency comes, 
it is going to move the goalposts for investors and for business and it's going to bring some very important new tools for government. What do I mean by that? To the extent that investors today are recognizing that optimizing risk return and impact is the way of the future, that if you don't take impact into account when making an investment decision, you're ignoring risks, the risks of uh, uh, consumers, uh, employees and uh, investors uh, deserting you, the risk of government taxing you or regulating you to constrain your uh, activities. Uh, and at the same time, ignoring new sets of investment opportunities, uh, looking at um, uh, impact uh, on, uh, on people uh, leads you to analyze underserved markets and define new products uh, that can enable you to improve the lives of people in these markets while delivering very attractive financial returns. And to the extent that investors recognize this uh, triple helix of, of risk, return and impact is going to characterize the successful companies of the future, then we realize that we're embarking on an impact revolution which is going to be as wide-ranging as the tech revolution that has preceded it. And I see entrepreneurs playing a fundamental role in driving this because the disruption that the tech brought was led by young entrepreneurs who started out wanting to change the world through the technologies that uh, they had uh, developed and then overtook uh, the leading companies in, in their fields uh, in the space of just uh, two or three decades. I see the same thing happening again now. And I just want to give you an example of what I mean by an impact venture, uh, by looking at a, a company here in Israel, I'm speaking to you from Tel Aviv, called uh, Orcam, to illustrate my point. The entrepreneurs who set up Orcam are among the very best in the world. They sold out their first venture for $15 billion uh, to Intel. Six, seven years ago, uh, one of the entrepreneurs uh, got the idea of using their technology, which had been developed for driverless cars, to help the blind to see. What do I mean by that? Uh, they created a company called Orcam, which manufactures a pair of spectacles with something like a memory stick hanging off uh, the side, which whispers into the ear of the wearer uh, the page of the book uh, they're reading or the newspaper or the banknote in, in their hand. And it read absolutely perfectly. Um, so very, very revolutionary uh, for a blind or visually impaired person. Now there are 35 million uh, blind people in the world and 250 million visually impaired ones. So you could say there's a market of 300 million people and investors recognized both the profit opportunity and the impact that this company could deliver. So it's raised $100 million uh, of capital so far and the last round was at a $600 million valuation. But if you look at a venture from an impact perspective, you ask yourself a question that you would never ask yourself otherwise, which is how can this technology help the greatest number of people in the world? And the answer in the case of Orcam is what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world. What would that do for their lives and for their livelihoods to bring them from being completely illiterate to being able to read? And so I believe that this is the venture of the future, that the unicorn of the future is going to be not just a venture that is worth a billion dollars, 
but a venture which improves the lives of a billion people. So I leave you now with uh, this thought that uh, India has the ability, both through its uh, entrepreneurship uh, and uh, creativity, to develop this field of impact investment to such a degree that it will become known as impact nation. Thank you, Ronnie. Continuing with our inspiring leaders, I'm pleased to introduce Anant Maheshwari, president of Microsoft India. Anant and I are both fellows of the Aspen Institute, and I have known him as a visionary leader, a true harbinger of the future, supporter of the Impact Future Project, or IFP, and co-chair of IFP's Healthcare Impact Community. At Microsoft, Anant works to ensure complete alignment between the company's mission of empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more with India's inclusive growth agenda. Please welcome Anant Maheshwari. It's an honor to be with all of you today at Sankal 2020. It is really inspiring to see Aspire in fact leading the way in bringing together more than 300 thought leaders to identify transformative ideas that will accelerate India's journey to becoming an impact nation. Accelerating progress in areas like education, skilling for employability, agriculture, water accessibility, and financial inclusion among others will be the key to solving India and the world's social and sustainability challenges. Access to quality healthcare will be a critical step in that journey. In the last few months, we experienced a more pressing need for transformation than ever before across every industry. The healthcare sector has been at the forefront of that transformation and in many ways, it has raised the bar on what we need to collectively deliver as an industry. Technology today is helping reimagine the healthcare industry and data and artificial intelligence are playing a key role in the journey of delivering better healthcare experiences, better insights, and most importantly, better care. We saw firsthand how data and artificial intelligence empowered those on the front lines of providing COVID-19 care. From the rise of telemedicine to using AI-assisted bots to ensure patients get the information they need, to using AI for rapidly learning from vast amounts of data that was getting generated, and to identifying which treatments were working and why. We are already seeing the power of reliable, accurate, and real-time information to improve operational monitoring, strengthen decision-making, and better understand the history, behavior, and needs of patients. With technologies like data and AI, we have the potential to deliver a personalized and integrated experience for patients, enhance provider productivity, engage formal and informal caregivers and improve outcomes and affordability. Precision medicine is the next frontier. Technology is accelerating our journey to personalized medicine. New diagnostic and treatment technologies coupled with robotics are charting a new course in genetics, biology, and immunology. These digital innovations coupled with the knowledge and quality of care provided by experts around the world, will result in a much better quality of healthcare at scale. One of the most important lessons we learned from COVID-19 pandemic is that healthcare is our collective responsibility. This will require a strong collaborative effort between the public and private sectors along with civil society to not only accelerate medical research and discovery, but 
to ultimately empower every person on the planet and in India to have access to high quality healthcare and empower all organizations providing healthcare services to deliver on that promise. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Our next speaker is Praveer Sinha, the CEO and Managing Director of Tata Power. Praveer Bhai has over three decades of experience and has been credited with transforming the power distribution sector and universally recognized as an expert commissioner of greenfield and brownfield power projects. A visiting scholar to IIT Delhi and MIT Boston, Praveer Bhai will co-chair IFP's Renewable Energy, Climate Infrastructure and Clean Tech Impact Community. Please welcome Praveer Sinha. Climate change is a reality now. Countries and companies globally are looking at opportunities to reduce their carbon footprint and move towards zero carbon. In this regard, power sector has a very, very important role to play, especially in countries and companies which are still using coal for producing power. We realize this and within Tata Power, we have decided that we will move towards zero carbon. In this regard, we have taken huge steps. Right now, our existing generation capacity has nearly one third of non-carbon generation, which will increase to 50% by 2025 and nearly 70% by 2030. And we be, want to be zero carbon by 2050. In our endeavor to become a zero carbon company, we will be taking up more of renewable projects, more of distributed renewable projects, which will go to the consumers, whether it is in urban areas or rural areas through the microgrids. And I'm sure this will be our small contribution to bring down the carbon footprint, which is there in the world today. I wish all of you take up the pledge that you will, over a period of time, become zero carbon and carbon neutral so that the globe and the countries become better places to live. Thank you. Thank you, Praveer Bhai. Our final speaker for day one is a woman recognized as one of India's top 30 most powerful women in impact by business today. Geeta Goyal is the country director for India at Michael and Susan Dell Foundation and manages the foundation's operations in India across education, livelihoods, and financial inclusion. The foundation has committed over $150 million in India already. She's also on the Council of Governors at Aspire Circle and a community leader at IFP's BFSI Financial Inclusion and FinTech Community. Please welcome Geeta Goyal. Climate change, growing and stark inequalities, COVID-19, the blatant discrimination amongst humans, humans on account of race, color, religion. Yes, things are bad and they can get better. The time to act is now. However, this time we need to take an approach that's different from the past. We need to anchor our approach around collaborations, collaboration between the market or the corporates, the government and the civil society or philanthropy. We need to shift the focus from shareholders to stakeholders. How do we make this shift happen? Yes, we need platforms like the Impact Future Project where we can get large scale, action oriented, forward looking players from all three dimensions of the market, government and philanthropy to come together in a collaborative way and seed ideas and scale ideas to change things in a sustainable way. 
If we take the example of financial services in India, we've already seen a couple of disruptions in the market, especially which bring about more equitable access. Yes, in early 2000, our microfinance market was less than half a million customers. It was primarily funded by philanthropy or small amounts of impact capital. Once the concept of microfinance in a sustainable way was proven, we saw private capital coming in and also triggered by enabling policy changes and government support like priority sector lending or you know, the setting up of SIDB, NABARD, etc. The market today is a 50 million customer base. Yes, it's only happened because the three players played a role in this market development. We've seen Aadhaar and India Stack bring about another wave of disruption in the market. Today, digital transactions are much easier, much more accessible than they were in the past. The cost of accessing a low-income customer, the cost of servicing a small ticket size loan is much lower than in the past. Yes, we have a demand base, an addressable demand base of more than $500 billion in the micro and small enterprise segment in India. We are not servicing this. Why not? Because we don't have data on these customers. We don't know how to reach these, reach these customers. And the lenders are risk averse because these customers may not have a common credit history. So what is the disruption that can happen? Yes. We need action on two fronts. One is an expedited and easy digitization process for this customer base. And two, we need guarantee mechanisms so to allow people, to allow lenders to lend to this segment in a risk mitigated way. We need to support the market to service this customer segment. And both these efforts on digitization and guarantees can be done in an innovative way using creative structures funded by government, philanthropy, impact capital, as well as market capital. We just need to make the first few steps and this market can actually be serviced in a financially viable large scale way. Thank you, Geeta. And so we end day one of a shared impact future. Please join me in thanking Roni, Anand, Praveer Bhai, and Geeta for a great start. Tomorrow and every day from 11 to 11.30 a.m. India time, once again, you will hear five great leaders, five great actors of the impact renaissance make a five-minute pitch each to you, a rare treat. Till then, from all of us at Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, have a great summit.